week in and week out, I am presented with a very difficult challenge, and that is to adequately articulate the gospel of grace, to adequately articulate what the Lord is embedding within my heart, and, and as you all know, to adequately articulate it within the time frame allotted us. It is quite a challenge. And I mean, really though, you can see the challenge. You can see the predicament that I find myself in every week. Here is a foolish, base, finite man trying to communicate the all-wisdom, all-exalted, infinite Savior. It is quite a challenge, a daunting challenge. And this is why I weekly and, uh, and daily, actually, ask the Lord that he would help me in delivering this great truth to you wonderful saints. I say this because the Word of God, as we know, is filled and packed with so much that informs and instructs us in our lives. And there are sometimes, there are some moments or monumental moments in the Word of God where his truth just emerges off of a page. There are some sections and there are even some verses where this monumental truth is given to us. And we find here this morning where we are at, at one of those places. We are in the narrative of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And not only do we have a monumental amount of truth in this one passage, but we also have a, a, a severating statement of truth found in verse 20, actually, where Jesus says this. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And so you see, it's, it's quite a task to articulate these things. And I pray that the Lord would deepen our understanding. I pray that his spirit would be the one to illuminate our hearts this morning. Um, I have to tell you, before we get into the text, at this moment in the life of our Lord, the Lord has concluded his public ministry. He has concluded his public teaching, that is. And we have entered into the commencement of the crucifixion. We've seen that last week with the scheming of the Sanhedrins and the plot of Judas along with the anointing of Mary at Bethany. That was the commencement of the crucifixion. And now where we are at in the gospel narrative is we are at Thursday evening where the Lord is going to institute his supper, the Lord's Supper. And he's going to share in these hours with his disciples the Passover meal. And it's quite a meal, you're going to see. He is not only going to institute his supper, but he's also, this is the, the same meal at which he washes the disciples' feet. This is the same meal the, at, at which he delivers the discourse concerning the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. All of that is material that's found in John's gospel in chapters 13 through 17. And after this Sunday, we are actually going to enter into those chapters. And I got to tell you, we probably are never going to get out of the life of Christ before he returns. Because those chapters are just packed and filled with so much truth. But this morning, I want us to concentrate our attention, attention on the commencement of that evening. And that is the institution of the Lord's Supper. Namely, what we commonly know as communion. And so look with me to Luke chapter 22. In verse 7, you're going to see as we read this text right now that the Lord is going to take one of the solemn feasts of Israel, particularly the pinnacle of all feasts, the Passover. He's going to take that feast and he's going to reinterpret it and reestablish it to be centered upon him and the cross. This is a monumental moment in the gospel where he is taking essentially the Old Testament and he is centering it upon the cross. You know, I told you last week, and I, I, as Peter says, as long as I'm in this tent, I've got to stir you up by reminding you, the cross is the center of the gospel. The cross is the center of the scriptures. Everything moves to the cross. 
All of the Old Testament moves and points to the cross. All of the New Testament moves away from the cross. The cross is the center. You see, what is about to happen right now is not a bad ending to a good beginning. That's, that's not what's happening here. This is the divine plan of God that Jesus go to the cross. The divine plan of God before the foundation of the world. And we've seen that last week. Ephesians 1, 4, Revelation 13, 8. He was slain before the foundation of the world. And so Jesus is going to essentially take the Old Testament today and he's going to explain how the Old Testament centers upon him. So look with me, verse 7, Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. And so they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you enter the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house. In which he enters, and then you shall say to him, the master. You shall say to him, the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. And so they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Verse fourteen. And when the hour had come, he sat down. And the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes. In verse 19, then he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In verse 23, then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now Luke loves mills. I gotta tell you that. In his gospel, I was looking at this throughout the week. Luke mentions at least eight different mill scenes in his gospel. This is the seventh of them. He was a foodie, what we call him. And this is obviously quite a mill to remember, or this is going to be a mill to remember. This is the mill where our Lord institutes the Passover. He establishes, or institutes the Lord's Supper, I'm sorry. He establishes that the Passover is all about him. We're going to see as we go along in this evening that it's also the same meal at which he identifies his betrayer. It's also the same meal at which he predicts Peter's denial. It's also the same meal at which he conveys the work and ministry of the Lord or the, the Holy Spirit. And then it's also the meal in which he gives the, the conclusion of his prayer, the Lord's Prayer, John 17 at which he prays for us in that prayer. In John 17 and in verse 20, he almost invites us to partake in this meal because he says in that, in that verse there, I do not pray for these only, but I pray for all of those who will believe in me through their word. That is us, who have come to believe in the gospel on the word of the apostles. And so he almost invites us to partake of this meal. And so as we go along our morning this morning, I want you to keep that in your mind. I want you to understand that this is an invitation to you to participate in the Lord's communion, in the intimacy that you're going to see that he has with his disciples. He wants to have that same communion and intimacy with each and every single one of us. 
Now he says that, or the author, Luke, tells us in verse 7, that the feast of unleavened bread, and, which is the Passover, he says, uh, was at hand. This was at hand. All, all of the Gospels tell us that this was taking place. Now during the time of Jesus, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were almost used, they were used synonymously. They were used to describe particularly the same feast. However, that was always not so. Technically, they were two different feasts. You can find this in Exodus chapter 12 and Leviticus 23. I'm going to read for you from Leviticus 23. You don't have to turn there, just listen. Leviticus 23 and beginning in verse 4, Moses writes this, These are the feasts of the Lord, the holy convocation, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. And he says, On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And then in verse 6 he says, On the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And so we see from Leviticus that Passover was actually on the 14th day of the first month. This is the 14th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. Now, uh, real quick fun fact for you. This is how we know, actually, that Jesus Christ was crucified on a Friday. Uh, because we learn in the gospel accounts that he began his ministry at the age of 30, right? Luke 3, verse 23, he began his ministry at the age of 30. We learn that he was baptized by John the Baptist six months into John the Baptist's ministry. John the Baptist's ministry began in 29 AD. How do we know that? Because Luke chapter 3, verse 1 says that he started his ministry during the reign, during the 15th year of the reign of Siberius, uh, Caesar, uh, Tiberius Caesar. And Tiberius Caesar began his reign in 14 AD. So if you add 15 years to that, you'll see that John the Baptist began his ministry in 29 AD, which tells us that Jesus either began his ministry in late 29 AD or in 30 AD. And he, we know that he ministered for how many years? Three years, which puts us at 33 AD. If you look in your calendar back to the first century, and you look at the 14th day of the month of Nisan, you will discover that it is a Friday. Um, if that isn't further convincing, John tells us in chapter 19 that he was crucified on the day of preparation, which is always described as the day before the Sabbath, before Saturday, a Friday. There's no point to that to the sermon. That's just fun for you to know that. But that is the 14th day of Nisan. You see how I get off track? Very quickly. But anyway, what I want to point out here is the parallels. The striking parallels between both of these feasts, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, between both of these feasts and the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are striking parallels. The first one is the Passover. As we know, the Passover what? It commemorates the liberation of the nation. That's what the Passover is. It commemorated God's deliverance of the nation of Israel in slavery and bondage to Egypt. And so it commemorated God's deliverance. That's what the Passover was. We see the same thing with the Passover our Lord. He was our deliverance. And when we look to the Lord's Supper, what are we doing? We are commemorating His deliverance over the bondage of the slavery of sin. You know, what's also interesting, here's another parallel, another parallel of the, pass, the Passover. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, you will discover in verse 3 that they had to select a lamb 10 days before the 14th day. So on the 14th day of Nisan, which is the Jewish calendar, the first uh, month of the Jewish calendar, on that 14th day, they had to to sacrifice the Passover lamb. But on the 10th day, they had to select the lamb. The lamb had to be selected according to Exodus 12, verse 3. And then in verse 5, the lamb had to be presented. This is Exodus 12, verse 5. The lamb had to be presented without spot and without blemish. 
That was the key to the Passover, right? When God told them to smear upon their doorposts and he will pass over them, this lamb had to be without spot and without blemish. Now here's an interesting parallel. If you look four days prior to this moment here where the Lord is having Passover with his disciples, four days prior to this, you have what is known as the triumphal entry where the nation of Israel, in a sense, selected their lamb. And they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then what's the next moment that happens right after that? After the nation of Israel selected their lamb, what happens right after that? He's inspected. How is that? He's inspected by the religious authorities. What is the first thing that they ask him? They ask him that inciting, inspecting question, by what authority do you do these things? And they, in, in a sense, inspect the lamb. And what is he found? Blameless. We have those four controversies that we spent way too much time looking at, but we have those four controversies where he is found blameless. And so you see the, the awesome, striking parallel between the Passover and between Christ. How he was a lamb selected on the 10th day and how he was sacrificed on the 14th day. Then you also have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a little bit different. This took place after the Passover. And what this represented was God, when God told the children of Israel to leave the land of Egypt, what did he tell them to do? Take no leavened bread with you. Do not take, you have unleavened bread. And the idea there is leaven is bread without yeast. And so it's bread without an influence in it. And the idea is that, as we all know, leaven symbolizes sin. It symbolizes the influence of sin. And so what God was saying was that old life of Egypt shall have no influence on you anymore. You shall no longer have that old life upon you, but you shall have a new life upon you. And we see how that parallels to our lives, does it not? How it parallels to us. As we now have accepted this Passover, the desire or ought to be the desire of our heart is to have no leaven in our life. In other words, not to be influenced by the sin of our past life. The Bible makes this explicitly clear many times. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 says it about as explicitly as it gets. Put off the old man and his former deeds and put on the new man, being renewed in knowledge according to the image of our creator. So Paul says it very explicitly there. In fact, actually, Colossians Paul actually uses the symbolism in Colossians uh, chapter 5, first, I'm sorry, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 6, Paul writes this. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so you see, Paul actually uses that symbolism to describe the life of a believer. That, a life of a, that the life of a believer is not to be influenced by the old life. We are to cut that old life off. And so you see these striking parallels between both of these feasts and the Lord and our own life. And now in verse 8, go back with me to Luke 22 and verse 8. It reads this way, that he sent Peter and John, and he said to them, go and prepare the Passover that we may eat. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare and Jesus says, Behold, when you have entered the city, you will find a man. He will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into his house. And then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
And then he will show you a large furnished room, a large furnished upper room. There make ready. And so they went and found it just as he had said, and they prepared the Passover. Now only Luke here identifies whom the Lord commissioned. He commissioned Peter and John. And it's a detail um, unique to Luke's account. It's interesting that you're going to see right now in a moment that this is quite an elaborate event to prepare. And it's interesting that he does not tell Judas to go. Why do I say that's interesting? Because Judas was the treasurer of the group. Judas had all the money in the group. So you would almost expect Jesus to ask Judas to go along and do these things. Because this is going to take a lot of preparation. You're going to have to procure all the materials that are necessary for keeping the Passover. You see, as divine as these verses are, you cannot uh, escape the miraculous rendezvous here between this man and Peter and John. And as divine as these verses are, they um, do not divulge to us the details behind this. The details that Peter and John would have had to do to, according to verse 12, make ready. You see, they would have had to procure, as I said, all of these materials. Not only would Peter and John have to go to the temple and go to the temple compound and have the lamb slain, not only would they have to do that, but they would have to procure all the elements involved with it. One of the elements is the bitter herbs. They would have to, in other words, Peter and John had to go shopping and they had to go find all of these things. And obviously, they didn't have a Walmart like we do today. This would have been a very daunting task for them to do. They had to go, get, why do I say a daunting task? Because you have to remember, this is the pilgrimage feast. How many people are in Jerusalem at this time? Hundreds of thousands of people are in Jerusalem at this time. You remember, I told you a while back that Josephus estimates that during the Passover feast, there was 250,000 lambs who were slain on this day. That's a lot of lambs. And we learn from the Mishnah, we learn that uh, a, a one sacrifice was uh, a, a substance sufficient enough for 10 different people. So if you do the math there, you're looking at a liberal number of how many people are in Jerusalem at this time, 2.5 million people. This is a lot of people. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, it's a tiny little city. It's not that big. And you have this many people who have entered into this city. So this is a huge task for them. So they had to procure all the elements. One of the elements was the bitter herbs. This is horseradish, uh, chicory. I like to say that word, chicory. These bitter herbs represented the bitter bondage of Egypt. And so they had to procure those. They had to procure the hyssop. They had to find the hyssop. Because the hyssop, as you remember from Exodus chapter 12 and verse 22, that was what was used to smear the blood on the doorposts. And so they had to attain the, the hyssop. They had to get what is known as the, um, I'm going to, so it's a difficult word to say, Haroset. You have to say it with a Hebrew accent. Haroset. And if you Google this, I got I to I share this with you. When I first seen this, I thought, man, Jewish people, they've got it down. If you look at this, if you just Google this and you do a glance look at it, the word is haroset and it's C-H-R, C-H-R-O-S-E-T. If you just Google this and you do a glancing look at it, it looks like chorizo and potatoes. And I'll tell you, the first time I went to a Passover, I was like, praise the Lord. Finally, something good here to eat in Israel. But then you're rudely surprised to discover that it is just mushed up apples and dates and pomegranates and nuts. And it's this kind of pasty looking thing. And I tell you, it looks like chorizo and potatoes. But the point of this caroset was that it represented the mud and the mortar at which the Jewish people were building their bricks and building uh, Egypt itself. And then finally, they had to procure a bowl of salt water. This was like a table setting. It was a centerpiece 
for the Passover, this bowl of salt water. They didn't consume it at all. It just sat in the middle of the table. And what that represented was the salty tears of slavery. And it represented the passing of the Red Sea. And so this was a lot of work that these guys had to do. And I love the way one writer puts it. One writer says that the Lord Jesus was teaching the leaders of the church how to be servants. I love that. He was teaching these great leaders, because these, both of these guys are going to go on to be pinnacles of the early church, Peter and John, and he was teaching them how to serve. And so it's, it's, it's obvious why they ask this very practical question, where? Where are we to do this? You see, this is the day of the Passover. Jerusalem, again, like I mentioned to you, Jerusalem is packed. There is probably no vacancy here. So Lord, where are we to do all these things? You've got to give us this practical answer here. And the answer that he gives them is nothing short of a miracle. He says to them, behold, when you enter the city, you're going to find a man. And when you find that man, he'll meet you and he'll be carrying a pitcher of water. And you know what I love about it? Verse 13 says, so they went and they found him. I love that. Matthew actually emphasizes their unhesitating obedience. Matthew says that they did as the Lord directed them. You, gotta, you just can't help but adore the faith and obedience of these men. I don't know about you, but if the Lord told you to go into a city that's probably filled with millions of people, and you're going to find one guy holding a pitcher of water. Lord, can you give us a little bit more of a detail here? What's his name? Maybe. But you see, this was actually a signal. Um, it was unusual and it was uncommon for men to be carrying pitchers of water. If you look at the scriptures, you'll see that this was often a woman's task. You see Jesus at the well in John 4 with the Samaritan woman. You see back in Genesis, the women carrying the pitchers of water. And so this was an unusual task for a man. And so that was essentially the signal. And you're going to see a man walking. He's going to be doing a very unusual task. Go and find him. And when you go and find him, tell him this. Tell him the teacher. And I love what Mark says. Mark adds that, uh, a detail that Luke and, 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 I'm sorry, Matthew adds a detail that Luke and Mark do not add. He says, the teacher says to you, my hour has come. My hour has come. And then he says, um, where is the guest room? So my hour has come, where is the guest room? That's what Matthew records for us. I love this whole interaction here. Because you see, here is this man. Let me put it this way. Jesus is giving this man a message. And the first thing that Jesus tells this man is my hour has come. My time is near. The word time there is not the Greek word chronos, which we get chronology from. It's not a, a moment of time. That's not what he's describing. It's the word kairos. So he's saying to him, my, you, you look at it, the connotation here, my special moment has come. This unique moment has come. And what Jesus is saying here is that when this man hears that phrase, this man is going to say, oh, okay, come on in, Jesus. This man is going to understand and he's going to know what this means. It refreshes my, and not only that, but also he's going to understand who is delivering this communication to him. They say to him, the teacher says to you, remember, it's the Passover. There are thousands of rabbis in Jerusalem at the time. Peter and John don't say to this man, the teacher from Nazareth. They don't say to him, the teacher, Jesus. They say to him, the teacher has said to you, my hour has come, where is your guest room? And this man immediately knows what that means. I love that. And I love that because Matthew describes him as a certain man. You will find a certain man. The man is nameless. We have no idea who this man is. The Bible doesn't provide his name for us. We don't know who he is from Adam. And yet this man is known by Jesus. Yet this man knows. You see, the Bible tells us that the Lord knows those who are his. And you see that the Lord knew that this man was his. 
Enough to know that as soon as the Lord asks a request of him, this man is going to drop everything he has and he's going to go and do this. I love that. Because, you know, sometimes, folks, we may be nameless on this earth. Nobody may never know who we are. But the Lord does. And the Lord knows the work that is given to him in his name. You see, here's this nameless man. And this nameless man, I I can't wait to meet this man, I'll tell you, in heaven. Because this nameless man is instrumental in the Lord instituting the greatest institution that he ever instituted, the Lord's Supper. This nameless man provided the place for the Lord. That is, it just brings so much uh, admiration to my heart for this man. Now verse 13, so they went and they found it just as he had said and they prepared the Passover. Now there's no record in the Bible of Peter and John returning to Jesus. Uh, we don't see that. Uh, and it's obvious. It's, it's certainly not like they had to go back to Jesus and inform him, give him directions of where this man was. We know that that's not what they had to do. Jesus knew who this man was. He knew what this man was doing. I'm sure Jesus didn't need help finding where he lived. That's not the reason Jesus sends these guys to do this. And so you see no record. The narrative goes right on in verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down. So it rises a question to us, or it raises a question to us. And the question is, why didn't Jesus just disclose who this man was? Why didn't, why didn't Jesus just disclose where he lived? Why didn't he do that? If Jesus knew who this man was, if Jesus knew that this man was going to be carrying a pitcher of water, I'm pretty sure Jesus knew where he lived. So why didn't he just tell Peter and John, you're going to go to such and such street, and then you're going to knock on the door and you're going to meet Michael and tell him you want to have Passover? Why didn't he do that? Why do we have this undercover Operation Passover, cloak and dagger activities going on here between Jesus and Peter and John? Well, the answer is very simple. The answer is that Jesus, not only does he know man, but he knows the heart of man. And what does he know? He knows the heart of Judas Iscariot. He knows that this betrayer has already went out to make a plot to find a convenient moment at which he can alert the Jewish authorities and betray Jesus. And there is no, and what was the reason for that? Why did he want to find a convenient moment? Well, the Sanhedrin, they said, why? Lest there be an uproar in the crowd. We want to find a moment in the absence of the crowd. Luke 22, verse 6. Find a moment in the absence of the crowd so that we can catch him by trickery. And so you see that Jesus uses this kind of Operation Passover and undercover so that he can keep from disclosing the location to Judas. If Judas would have known the location of the Passover, then this upper room would have been the perfect place for Judas to alert the authorities and have Jesus arrested in the solitude of this room away from all of those in Jerusalem at the time. I don't know about you, but the orchestration here of the Lord's Supper in keeping this from Judas makes me marvel at his sovereign grace. Makes me marvel that there is nothing outside of his power and control. That his life, up to his crucifixion, every aspect of his life was completely in control. You see, Jesus understood. Jesus recognized that he couldn't be crucified just yet. Why? Because he had to be crucified on Friday at Three o'clock, actually. Or he had to die Friday at three o'clock. We learn this from Josephus. Josephus tells us that, um, and even according to the Mishnah, that the Passover lamb was sacrificed at 3 p.m. And so Jesus needed to be sacrificed at 3 p.m. His hour was not yet come. And Jesus needed to spend some time with his disciples this Thursday evening, preparing them. Preparing them by illustrating to them the work of the Holy Spirit. And so all of this was completely in his control and power. Then we look at verse 14. Verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover 
with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus, he uses the noun um, epithuomi, and he couples it with the verb epithuomeo. And the idea there, it's, it's fervent. I have a fervent desire, epithuomi. I have desired, or I'm sorry, with fervent desire, I have desired. He's coupling both of these nouns together. And the point, the emphasis that he is trying to convey to them is the depth of his desire that he wants to have this Passover meal with him, with them. The depth of his desire that he wants to share this communion with him. You see, you're going to see, as I mentioned earlier, that the conclusion of this evening was oneness. That was the whole point of this. It commences with communion, which describes our oneness with God through Jesus Christ. And it concludes with oneness. In John 17, when Jesus prays that they would be one as you and I are one in another. Oneness is the centrality of the gospel. God wants us to be one with him through Jesus Christ. Reconciled with him through Jesus Christ. Christ. And you see Christ's deep desire to want to do that. I have fervently desired to have this meal with you. And you know, I love this phrase here. He just kind of adds it in, in a sense. Before I suffer. Before I suffer. I love that phrase. Jesus knew that no more than a few hours from now, no more than a day, He is going to endure terrible suffering. He's going to endure a depth of suffering far beyond our finite comprehension. It's far beyond our comprehension and you see that it is because you see it reflected in the agonizing cry that he has on the cross. And what is it? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Describing the suffering that he is enduring on our behalf. You see, the strength of our life, the strength of grace in our life, the hope of the gospel in our life, the power of grace in our life is found in one thing and one thing only. Do you know what it is? It's what Jesus says at the end of the Great Commission. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's found in Hebrews 13 and verse 5. I will never what? Leave you nor forsake you. That is the strength of our life. Is that we will never experience a life apart from God. In fact, folks, we never have. We may not have believed in him at a certain point in time, but we have never experienced his judgment. You see, Jesus experienced it. Jesus became sin on the cross. And he bore the full judgment of God. And do you know what the full judgment of God? It's the absence of his presence. Where his presence departs from us. We see this in the writings of Paul when he says to the, uh, to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians. And in chapter 1 he says that when Christ returns, he will return in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and these shall be punished, how? With an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see, the judgment that will come upon people who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the absence of God's presence. It's called hell. And Jesus bore that on the cross for us. Jesus experienced the absence of God's presence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he experienced that so that you and me could never experience it. We'll never have to experience it. The hope of our life is I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the strength of our Christian faith. And so Jesus says to them before I suffer. In verse 17, Then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. 
That really illustrates right there. Divided among yourselves. The intimacy of the moment. Dividing something among yourselves. During this time, you, you divided the bread. When you divided the bread, it was one loaf of bread. And so when you divided it, you all ate of that one substance. In other words, you became one. It expressed intimacy. And this is what the Lord is doing here. He is intensifying the oneness, the desire for oneness with his disciples, that he took it and divided it among themselves, told them, divide it among yourselves. Again, I can't stress enough for you. That's the point of this evening. The point of this evening is that Jesus is saying, I am going to suffer. And the reason I'm going to suffer is so that you can become one with God. The reason that I'm going to suffer is that so you can experience reconciliation with God. Divided among yourselves. And then he says, for I say to you, that I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes. Notice that word until there. Until the kingdom of God comes. In other words, that's a prophecy. Jesus is giving a prophecy here. The word until describes an expression of time. And so Jesus is saying from this moment until I return. I mentioned to you at the beginning of our time that, that Jesus, when they asked Jesus, you'll see later on at the trial of Jesus, early morning, Friday morning, the high priest puts Jesus under an oath. And he says to you, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And what is Jesus' response to him? It is as you say. Nevertheless, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is saying, one day you will see me reestablish my kingdom. You see, right now we experience his spiritual kingdom. Right now we experience mercy, grace, forgiveness, satisfaction found in knowing Christ. We experience that now. But there comes a day and there will come a day when he will fulfill our redemption. Right now we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. But there is going to come a day when he is going to perfect our redemption. A day when he is going to establish his kingdom. You see the Passover in a sense is not completely complete. He says it here. Until it is fulfilled. It's completed in the spiritual sense. We have spiritually entered his kingdom, but it's not completed in the physical sense. You see, the, fa the Passover commemorated what? God's deliverance from the people, taking them from a foreign land and bringing them to the promised land. That's what the Passover describes. And the same thing is true for us. We have been taken from a foreign land that is the land of our sinful nature and we've been brought to a spiritual land the promised land of our heart of the holy spirit dwelling in us the love of god being poured out into our hearts by his spirit but there's going to come a day when our bodies are going to be perfected when our bodies are going to be glorified when our bodies are going to be completed in the presence of the lord and that is when he comes back and establishes his kingdom on earth as we read at the commencement of our time this morning the government will be upon his shoulders and his kingdom will be an everlasting one. And so he says to them, he gives them this prophecy. I'm not going to drink of this until it is fulfilled. I'm awaiting. In verse 19, he says, then he took the bread, and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. In verse 20, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. His body and his blood represent a powerful metaphor. A powerful, and let me say this first of all, a powerful figure of speech never intended to be taken literally. Let me say that. Jesus is no more a piece of bread than he is a door. Amen. You see, you remember in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus is not saying, I am literally a door. Later on in this evening, in John chapter 15, in verse 5, he's going to say, I am the vine. Jesus is not a literal vine. And so the same thing is here. 
if we take this to mean it literally, then we have discarded the rules of hermeneutics. This is a metaphor. This is a figure of speech. Now, why do I say this? I say this because there is a very false teaching known as transubstantiation, which teaches that when a priest consecrates communion, then the crackers and the juice turn into the actual blood and actual body of Christ. And that is a very false teaching that has led many people astray. And so this is a powerful metaphor that he is using here. And the metaphor is symbolic. It's symbolic that he is saying, my body and my blood are going to serve as the vicarious substitution atonement for you. For you. I love that. Because you look at it both times. In verse 19, he says, this is my body, which is given what? For you. You look at verse 20. This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed what? For you. For you. You know, this is something, the fact that Christ died for you is something that is repeated throughout the New Testament. You see, and I'm talking about for you. I mean that personally. You see, it's easy for us to understand that corporately. It's even easy for us to understand that theologically. But I want you this morning to resonate with that truth personally. That he died for you individually. And he would have died for you if you were the only person in the world. He died for you. We see this repeated throughout scripture. Galatians opens up this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. You go on to the next chapter, in chapter 2, in verse 20, Paul says, um, For I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and what? Gave himself for me. Paul made the gospel very personal. He gave himself for me. Jesus says it himself in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd what? Lays down his life for his sheep. The hireling doesn't do that. The hireling sees the wolf and runs, but the good shepherd sees the wolf. He confronts him and he lays down his life for his sheep. Folks, you are his sheep, corporately and individually. And he has laid down his life corporately and individually for you. Each and every one of us for you. I love the personal nature that Jesus puts on both of these statements. You see, when you understand that, when you understand that it has been done for you, you understand the new access and approach to which you have to God. The writer of Hebrews illustrates and articulates that approach that you have to God. Turn with me. Hebrews 10. Very quickly. Hebrews 10 and in verse 19, the author of Hebrews puts it this way. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up works and love, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And so the author of Hebrews says there, 
when you understand the personal nature to which the blood of Christ has given you access, you come with full assurance to his throne. You come with boldness to his throne. I don't know about you, but when's the last time you came to the throne of God with boldness? It's a hard thing for me to come to the throne of God with boldness. But the Bible says we can. And it says we can on one reason and one reason alone. The perfect blood of Jesus Christ. We can enter his throne room. Why? Because he has made us like him. Because he has reconciled us to him. Self. Through Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then you'll see as we're going to do this morning, you see this phrase in verse 19. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. The emphasis, the emphasis of this command is, lest you forget. <clears throat> Excuse me. My throat. Sorry, I'm going to take a cough drop. Lest you forget is the emphasis of the command. Do this in remembrance of me so you don't forget me. Now that almost seems unthinkable that we would forget the Lord, right? But the Lord certainly understands the human propensity of forgetfulness. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever been guilty of forgetting the Lord? If you say no, then I definitely know you're guilty of lying. Because we all forget the Lord. Sometimes we can as easily forget him as driving out of this parking lot here. As soon as we drive out of this parking lot, somebody cuts us off and we forget everything we just learned. We can forget the Lord. And you know, the Old Testament is filled with accounts over and over again that the spiral, uh, the downward spiral of the nation was often embedded in forgetfulness. You see this in the cycle of Judges. What is the cycle of Judges? The children of Israel forgot the Lord their God and did what was right in their own eyes. And this is why Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. You know, I think that this is one of the things, in my opinion, that makes David a man after God's own heart. Because David was often reminding himself of who his God was. We see this over and over again. Psalm 103, in fact. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Who forgives your iniquity. Who restores your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies and satisfies your mouth with a good thing so that your life is renewed like the eagles. This is Psalm 103, something that David wrote. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself. Bless him, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. I believe that is what made David a man after God's own heart, was that he constantly preached to himself. You know, folks, I can tell you one of the most spiritual strengthening exercises that you can do in your life is to wake up in the morning and preach the gospel to yourself. First thing you do before you get out of the bed, preach the gospel to yourself. It is one of the most fruitful things a person can do, reminding themselves of the truths of scripture. Because how many of you find yourselves at a place where you can encourage somebody else and yet inside, that's hard for you to understand. And very often we have to preach the gospel to ourselves. Remind ourselves, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Forget not his benefits. And you see here, Jesus wanted us to do this in remembrance of him. And there's several reasons why. One of the first reasons is because it causes us to slow down, I think. When we come corporately to do communion, it causes us to a place of restful meditation. This pilgrimage of life, this fast pace of life, the communion table causes us to slow down. Take a minute and slow down upon these elements here. Meditate upon them. We're going to see as we close that Paul is going to say, examine yourself. 
because it causes us to do that. And there's other reasons why the Lord tells us to do this in remembrance of him. One of them is that it paints a graphic picture of salvation. He's saying here, this is my body and this is my blood, which is sacrificed for you. When we take that in connection with Passover and all of the lambs that were slain, oral tradition says that the blood that ran from the temple poured all the way down the Kidron Valley into Bethlehem. That's how much blood you see. It's a graphic picture of sacrifice. And this is what communion does for us. It gives us a graphic picture of the sacrifice that God has made for us. It reassures us of the grace of the cross that God has provided a substitute for us through Jesus Christ. It clearly gives us a prophecy. The prophecy is that he will come one day and he will fulfill all of this. And you know, the last thing we see in verse 21 is that behold... The hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes, and it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. If you look at John's account, you'll see that Jesus actually identifies who the betrayer was. I'm sorry, I know you guys came up here, but we're going to John's account. <laughs> sorry. If you look at John's account, you see this. In verse 21 of chapter 13, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit. When he said the communion, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. In verse 22, the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was one leaning on Jesus on his bosom, the one whom he loved. And Simon Peter motioned to him and asked and said to him, lean back and ask Jesus, who is it? In verse 26, Jesus answered and said, it is he whom I give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And then you see in verse 28 that no one at the table understood this reason. No one understood why he gave it to, to Judas. You know, first of all, it's heartbreaking. Jesus is troubled in his spirit. We learn from John's account that Judas was so close to Jesus that obviously there's, this is a group of 12 men. He was in close proximity to where Jesus can dip his bread and hand it to him, which most scholars believe that Judas was sitting on the other side of Jesus. John was on one side and Judas was on the other. That's how close he was to him. And you know, my point in saying all this is that the disciples all looked and they were perplexed. You see it here in the account here, they began to question among themselves, who is it? In Mark's account, it says that they asked one by one, is it I? Is it I? Did I do this? Am I going to do this? You see, the disciples, in a sense, examined themselves. Now turn with me as we close this time. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, and beginning in verse 23. <clears throat> For I, res I have received from the Lord, which I delivered to you also, that at the night that Jesus, on the same night in which he, he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant. Do this and drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup 
For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So Paul calls for the exhortation to examine ourselves when we come to the Lord's table. And you see it there that this night, these guys in a sense examine themselves. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? You see, there are two ways, two very simple ways that we examine ourselves for the Lord's table. The two ways are to examine our attitude and to examine our actions. Examine our attitude and our actions. And what should be the attitude when we come to the Lord's table? What should be the attitude when we grab the elements of communion? It's the same thing that Jesus did. If you look both times in the passage that we looked at, both times that he dis distributed the bread and the wine, the Bible tells us that he what? Gave thanks. Both times he gave thanks. The entire commemoration of the Feast of Passover is giving thanks. Giving thanks to God. And so the attitude that the believer ought to have when they come to the Lord's table is thankfulness, is thanksgiving. Thankfulness of what he has done for us. Thankfulness of the assurance of salvation. Thankfulness of the hope of the gospel. You see, and we need to examine ourselves. Really, am I a complainer? Am I a despairing person? Am I one of those complaining, cantankerous Christians? We've all met them. Sometimes we are them. We've all experienced that in our lives. You ever experience that complaining, cantankerous Christian that you look at them and you say, I definitely don't want to know who your God is because if this is the outcome, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to know him. Or is our heart moved with an attitude of thanksgiving where people see the way we are, where we are marked by our thanksgiving? This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may be harmless and blameless children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. In other words, Paul's saying there, the generation, the world we live in, complains. Everybody is a complainer. And you know, when we complain, what we are saying is we have no trust in the Lord. We have no adoration for the Lord. That's what complaining really is. And so the attitude in which we should approach the first one is an attitude of thanksgiving. We should examine our attitude. The second is we should examine our actions. You see, this night here of the Passover, you're going to see the actions of the disciples. Judas betrays him. The apostles abandon him. I mean, heck, the, even, the next verse, if you look back in Luke 22, in verse 24, the next verse, after he is declared and instituted the Passover, says that a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. You see, we have to examine our actions. Do my actions, do they show that my life is loyal to my Lord? Do my actions show that my life represents what I believe? These are the ways in which we examine ourselves. And here's the hope. The hope is, is that if you do examine yourself and you find yourself wanting, you find yourself unworthy, The point is not to abstain from taking the Passover, from not, I'm sorry, the, the Lord's communion. Paul says, let us examine ourselves so that we may take communion. You see, the point is that when we do examine ourselves, and that's the point, folks, when we do really examine our hearts, we come to him in repentance. We come to him pleading his grace and mercy and forgiveness. And the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. There is no sin in our life that is outside of the forgiveness that's found in Christ. And so when we find ourselves examining ourselves and we're unworthy, the point is not to abstain from this meal. The point is to sit there in our hearts and renounce and repent of the things our attitudes and our actions in our lives. 
And so as these lovely, patient people, as they play this first song and the Lord moves in your heart, I want to encourage you to come forward and grab the elements of communion. Hold on to them because I want us all to take it corporately as a body of Christ. Amen.